All, All right. right, Josh, it's your turn. You have 24 minutes now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, thank you. Well, everybody, you can see my screen, I hope. Good good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Spring developer advocate, a Google, Kotlin Google developer expert, a, a Java champion, and of course, I'm at your service. I am also the author of a book called Cloud Native Java, which is all about how to build reactive, uh, sorry, resilient systems with Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, Cloud Friendly. Uh, and the book is something on which my co-author and I worked long and hard. The cover, I think, is kind of relevant here. It's a blue it's the animal the, the the bird that was depicted on the cover is a blue-eared kingfisher which is a bird that is uh, indigenous or native to the indonesian java island so it's a bird that is indigenous to the indonesian java islands or native to the java islands and birds fly through the clouds so it's a bird that flies through the clouds that is native to the java islands it's a cloud native java uh, bird and that's the book about which i was just speaking uh with melissa brian and and bruno um anyway Today, my friends, we're going to talk about building cloud native systems. And of course, getting to production these days, where so often, uh, indeed more often than not, production is a cloud environment, is incredibly important. Getting to production uh, is something I think most people are struggling to do. They know that they need to get there quickly, more reliably, more repeatably, uh, but they struggle with how. And they look for ways to make the process go faster. They look at technologies uh, that can help them reduce the cycle time between concept to customer. Right, and to repeat that process as quickly as possible. Speed in of itself is not in, is not what we want. Anybody can take a Ferrari and drive it straight into a wall at great speeds. That's not important. What we want is safety in that cycle time, right? How quickly can I take an idea, introduce it into production, learn from that, and then optimize accordingly, respond accordingly, right? How quickly can I be agile? Uh, and so people look for ways to do that. They look at continuous delivery and test driven development and microservices and all these buzzwords from the last 20 odd plus years that really, if you think about it, their novelty is in their speed. It's not like we didn't have ways to deploy servers before. It's not like we didn't test software before. It's the cycle time that we're optimizing for. It's the ability to incorporate what we've learned in production and to approve upon that. One natural consequence of this struggle for uh, this, this, this striving for, uh, for velocity uh, is that you look for ways to reduce the size of the code base and that leads you to things like microservices. Microservices themselves are a consequence of your goal to go more quickly to production. They are not a technology pattern, right? It's more of a, a, a process pattern. It's more of a way of organizing your organization in such a way as to benefit from uh, cycle time by reducing the group of people working on the code base, you reduce the cycle time it takes to go through and incorporate all the changes to stabilize, freeze, and deploy those changes into production. So today, my friends, we're going to look at just a number of different things that you should care about in the Spring ecosystem that make building services intended for production more, uh, more, more you know, make it go more quickly. So obviously, to get our journey started, we're going to go to my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place, as always, is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. The weather's amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. But if you haven't been to production, you can begin your journey here at Start.Spring today. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application. Uh, we're going to use Java 17. Java 17 is the latest and greatest long-term supported version of Java. Uh, it's, it is the least viable, like it is the least viable, but still viable version of Java uh, that you can use in 2022. Java 17 is the right thing to do in 2022. Uh, there are other versions of Java on this page, namely Java's 11 and 8, uh, which are non-choices. When I say non-choices, that's not just a, a type of Indian bread, my friends. That's a choice that you could make, but that you absolutely should never make. Uh, it's a choice uh, that would serve you wrong. Instead, choose Java 17 because it is the latest long-term supported version of Java. It's robust. It's got more syntax, more features, more performance, more security. Uh, it's just a better choice technologically in every single conceivable way. It's also morally the better choice in every conceivable way. You will not like the look of shame and disgust in your children's eyes when they find out that you're using Java 8 in production. Don't do it. Be the change you wanna see in the world. Do the right thing. Use Java 17. Uh, I'm a big fan of Java 17. And remember, if only if you judge only by the number of the version alone, then it's at least twice, it's more than twice as good as Java 8. And so for that reason, if no other, uh, you should choose it. We're going to add some technologies here that make building highly scalable uh, applications a little bit easier. We're going to add the reactive support. Reactive programming is a way to build services that takes better, makes better use uh, of, uh, of I.O. And it, makes it, it lets you write code in such a way that your services handle much better scale while also being more robust and uh, more uh, um, 
resilient, and I guess is the right word. So we're gonna bring in the Spring Boot Actuator to, uh, to give us uh, support for uh, observability. Uh, you saw Ryan talk about some of that being incorporated into Spring Framework 6. And we're gonna bring in the, uh, at the moment, experimental Spring native support. A lot of this work will also end up being in Spring Framework 6. So going forward, maybe in a year's time, if I come back, hopefully Spring Boot 3.0 GA will be out in Spring Framework 6 GA, I'm, both of which are expected to land, as far as I know, sometime later this year. Um, it, it, oh, you know, by that point, I won't need this. It'll just be Spring Framework 6. It just has it out of the box. Okay, so we're going to hit generate, and that'll give us a new service. And we're not going to spend too much time in the service. The goal here is not to, to uh, linger too much in that. Let's see here. Uh, UAO customers.zip. We're just going to build a very, very quick service, something that has some data, something that we can work with very, very quickly uh, so that we can get to the business of uh, uh, talking about its production concerns. Okay, so this is just a brand new public static void main Spring Boot application, nothing all that special. Uh, I'm going to build an application that manages data of type in, uh, customer whose uh, primary keys of type uh, integer and uh, who's got a field uh, called name, okay? And I'm gonna create a repository to manage instances of this type, extends reactive CRUD repository. Uh, here we go. And this is just an object. It's just a an interface that'll handle uh, data access, the te tedious, soul annihilatingly boring data access lifecycle logic. And I'm gonna create a uh, an HTTP endpoint. So I'm gonna call this customer uh, REST controller, I could call it customer HTTP controller, I suppose. Uh, and we'll add customer repository. Okay, I'm just gonna create a simple endpoint. I'm gonna inject this into the constructor uh, and then we're gonna create an endpoint to serve up that data, right? So customer get return this dot customer, uh, this dot uh, repository at find all, voila. Okay, there's my uh, simple HTTP application. I need some sample data. Obviously I'm using an in-memory embedded SQL database and because it's uh, in-memory and embedded, it's gonna lose all of our data every single time we restart. So we have to bootstrap it. So I'm gonna create a file here called schema.sql. And I'll just I'll just say create table customer ID serial primary key, whoops, key name var car 255 not null. Very good. Uh, and we're gonna have some, some data, just some sample data of people who uh, are in the customer table. Um, let's see. We're gonna have uh, Melissa, of course. We'll have, uh, who else, uh, Jenna, Brian, um, uh, Teresa, uh, Bruno, um, Asir, uh, I don't know, that's seven. Uh, who else can I put? Uh, did, I, did I put Ryan? I don't think I did. And just somebody else, who can else? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, Jurgen, there we go. So there's our sample eight names. It's a nice round number. If you divide it by two and then two again, it's still two, which makes it easier to sleep at night. Good, so there's our application. Let's just go ahead and just spin this up and see what that gives us. I'll take some coffee. I think I've earned it. Okay, so local host, uh, 8080 customers, not cust, uh, there we go, customers. Voila, it's worked great. Now that's not all that I wanted to talk about. And indeed, indeed, what I really care about here is what this looks like in production. So. First things first, I'm gonna to wanna to support observability. And to do that, I'm gonna use the actuator. The actuator exposes a number of HTTP endpoints that surface information uh, about the application. Because remember, in production, nobody can hear your application scream. You have to give it the ability to articulate its own state so that it can work in cooperation with your uh, cloud technology, namely things like Azure Spring Cloud. Um, and, uh, and it surfaces health information, it surfaces a whole bunch of other stuff there. So localhost 8080 forward slash actuator, voila. And you get all these managed HTTP endpoints, your health endpoint, your info endpoint, conditions, your environment, metrics. This is powered by Micrometer. Ryan spoke about that as well. That'll be further integrated in Spring Framework 6.0 later this year. Um, so just good stuff. We got observability. We got the health endpoint. Uh, we got information you can use to identify the service, et cetera. Very good. Now, I want to take this to production. Obviously, I have a public static void main Spring application with some sample data in it. Not all that impressive, but it's something. I want to go to production with that. These days, there's two things I want to take advantage of. One is I want to take advantage of native image compilation. So Ryan and Bruno, I, I think, spoke about that to some extent earlier on. We're going to take advantage of GraalVM. Now, GraalVM was originally an open JDK drop-in replacement that had its own custom hotspot replacement, which is great, but that's just-in-time compilation. If just-in-time compilation is so great, why not proactively do it ahead of time? And that's what you get when you use the native image compiler in GraalVM to ahead of time, to before you've deployed the application, to compile the whole thing into native code. The only problem with this is that GraalVM hates your code a lot. I mean, the native image compiler 
hates it a lot, right? It wants your code to fail. And so as a result, it throws away all the stuff your application is going to need that it doesn't see at compile time, right? So things like types that you reflect on, proxies, uh, jar resource loading, all these kinds of things that it cannot deterministically see for obvious reasons because you know nothing could, uh, it throws that away. And the problem is you have to tell it about that. Well, if you don't tell it about that, it's going to try and create an application that's a native image that is lacking in all this stuff. Uh, and your application is going to start and then immediately fail because it's going to miss a type or miss some types that it's going to do reflections on or whatever. So you need to provide that configuration. Spring Native is a project that we created that provides all that configuration to the GraalVM compiler for you because it knows about the common patterns typical of enterprise Java workloads, right? Because of Spring. And and so that support is already there. You can see it's it's here. I didn't have to do anything besides add Spring Native at the Spring Initializer. Uh, it's going to compile the application uh, and turn it into a native binary. Now, obviously, I'm on a Mac as we speak, so this native binary isn't going to work particularly well uh, if you're trying to deploy it into a Linux container. But that gets us to the next point, which is build packs, right? And uh, Brian and sorry, uh, Bruno and Ryan, the portmanteau of which I guess is Brian. Ryan and uh, Bruno spoke about build packs a little bit earlier as well. It's a great technology that allows you to take your application and turn it into a Docker image, a container. Uh, and it's just supported out of the box. You know, I don't have to do anything special here. It's already pre-configured when you have the Spring Boot Maven plugin on the class path, as we do. Um, and uh, it'll, just, it'll just create a Docker image for you, and then you can Docker tag and Docker publish that image. If you are using Spring Native, it'll run a, a Docker, it'll create a Docker image uh, with a native image inside of it. So it'll compile the code in the Linux container create a native image in that in the builds phase. And then the container that you get is the Linux binary in the Linux container that you can then Docker tag and Docker publish. Uh, even better, if you're using GitHub Actions, thank you, Microsoft, uh, you can do cross compilation because there's a GraalVM uh, plugin that you can use. Uh, so you can actually do you know, a matrix build for, for Mac, Linux, Windows, whatever, right? Okay, so here's just a regular binary. I didn't bother doing the Docker container, but you can see this is gonna go a little slow the first time because it's gonna ask for permission. So hit that, okay. Control C, voila, there you go. So there's our application, it's up and running. It takes 77 uh, thousandths of a millisecond. It takes about 100 megs of RAM for the entire application, not RAM, uh, for footprint and RAM, yeah, basically. Uh, I'm on a Mac, it's actually less on Linux for reasons I don't quite understand. Uh, but anyway, just try it out. It, th there's your native binary. So now we've got a native binary that starts up in no time at all, that has uh, takes up no footprint. No space, no nothing. Uh, I want to build an edge service. I want to build something to talk to that. So I'm going to return to my second favorite place on the internet. And we're going to build an edge service. And here, we're going to use the reactive web support. We use Spring Cloud Gateway. And we're going to use Spring Boot 2.70 milestones, or RCs. Uh, that's imminent, right? I think next month. I don't. I, there's a, it's a six-month release cadence. So by that math, I think it's next month sometime. Or maybe this month. No, probably this month, actually. We're in May already. already. Uh, and we're going to use GraphQL, yeah? So I'll bring in these bits. Uh, we're going to go ahead and... Uh, use Java 17 again because it's the right thing to do, um, and we're going to go ahead and hit generate, and that'll give us a uh, a new application. And this is going to be an edge service. It's a, a service that you can use to act as the intermediary between the outside world and the downstream services, uh, your microservices, your 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 service that we've just built, for example. So let me see, Maven clean package. This is a great time to do this uh, right now. What is happening? Uh, da -da -da. Spring forced. I don't care. Okay, you know what? We can just skip the gateway bit. Where the time it's taken to figure this out has cost me the time it would have taken to I would have taken to use that. What is going on here? Do, do, do. I don't care about that. Let me just remove the bomb. Something weird right now. I don't care to figure it out. Nope, not that. That's a good one, but not what I wanted. Uh, clean package. Go team. All right, good stuff. Okay, so I have a, a brand new application. Apparently it did a release in the last uh, few days that I've just forgot to do a Maven sync on. Um, so this edge service is gonna sit as the first port, of, first port of call for requests coming in from the outside world. It's a great place in which to enter, to handle in, incoming requests and to forward them to the downstream service. One way uh, you could accommodate those incoming requests because there are gonna be different kinds of clients, right? iPhones, iPads, uh, Androids, all these kinds of things. One way to accommodate those different kinds of clients is to transform the requests uh, at the edge. And you could have proxied them. You could use Spring Cloud Gateway, for which, by the way, we have a, like a commercial thing for Kubernetes if you want. But uh, you can also just use the Java API, which is what I was going to do, but for some weird oddity there in the uh, resolution of the, the package. Um, uh, and so Spring Cloud Gateway is an API gateway, very, very convenient. 
uh, or you could build some Java code to talk to your downstream services. In Spring Framework 6, we're going to have a generic mechanism that looks kind of like Spring Cloud OpenFane or Spring RetroSocket or Spring Cloud Square um, uh, you know, retrofit support. All these interface-based declarative clients all have a common goal, which is to make it so that you can define an interface and automatically get a client that will make uh, you know, RPC calls basically uh, to your downstream services, be, it, be they HTTP or RSocket based. Well, that mechanism has been spread across different implementations, different foundational pieces. We're going to converge upon one uh, abstraction, one mechanism, and the core Spring Framework 6 uh, uh, framework, and on top of which we'll then build these different uh, clients. So that'll be in Spring Framework 6, and you could use that uh, here as well. You can also write the code manually. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a uh, CRM client that'll talk to our our little uh, HTTP customer service. And this is going to use the HTTP client called the web client. I'll add this to the constructor. It's going to be a regular spring bean at component. Uh, and it's just going to return uh, the data from that customer service. So customer, uh, and it's just a record. And of course, same idea. I'm going to create a, a DTO, a struct. Uh, this is something terrible, something you should never ever do. I basically just copied and pasted code from one thing to another, which is terrible. Don't ever do that. Not even at home when nobody's looking. Uh, and we're going to get the customer data. Yeah. So I'm going to say return this dot HTTP dot uh, get URI HTTP local host 8080 forward slash customers dot retrieve dot body to flux customer dot class. Okay. There's the data. Now, obviously this might fail, right? Network fit services uh, sometimes fail. So you can do retries. You can say retry dot back off duration of, you know, seconds, whatever you can do a, uh, uh, on error resume, and when there's some sort of exception, you can return an empty stream instead. You can do timeouts. You can do all sorts of things. And notice that these operators that I'm using here uh, are are part of the reactive API. This is not specific to HTTP or RSocket or whatever. So anything that speaks reactive, you can use these retry when and on error and timeout and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I've got now a client, and I can use that to create a simple endpoint. You know, class CRM REST controller, and this is acting as a kind of a proxy as a as a pass through, you know, you could also do composition, reactive service orchestration composition by calling other network services. Uh, reactive programming is great for doing that kind of stuff. Um, and so here, I'm just going to say git mapping uh, customers, you know, this is a, let's just say that, and we're going to say publisher customer get, okay, and I'm going to inject again, the uh, customer repository there. So not this, the CRM client. So remember, we're acting as a client to the downstream service, because the goal here is to provide a view of the data. In this case, I'm not really doing anything to the data in particular, but the goal here is to provide a view of the data that accommodates a particular client. Uh, and that client could be an iPhone, an Android device, whatever. And they might have different bandwidth constraints and, and so on. So you don't want to make them make different calls to different network services, right? You want to do that uh, on the server side. So I'm doing that here for the client. So it doesn't have to do that uh, on its side. In order for this to work, we need an uh, actual HTTP uh, client. So I'm going to build one here like so. Return the uh, return builder.build, .build, voila, restart. Uh, there's my HTTP client. I can just as easily build a, a RSocket client. That's fine. So localhost 9999 forward slash, uh, what did I say? Customers. Uh, internal status 500 customers. Come on. Uh, this dot CRM localhost. Did I not start this up? Uh, this is up and running, right? Looks like it is. So... Let's just make sure localhost uh, customers, there it is, 99.99 forward slash customers. That's not working. Why? Let's see, localhost. Actually, better yet, just go with what you know. This didn't work. 80.80, okay, paste that. Is there anything different here? Body to flux, retry, timeout, customer. Uh, Multi-value reactive types not support. Ah, people. This is a uh, component, but the kind of controller I'm building is a regular REST controller, not a view controller. So response body, we start that, voila. Okay, so that'll give us our, our client-side representation of the data. You can use reactive programming to get around, that's uh, 8080, here's 9999, great. Uh, that said, I've had to create a simple reactive API to accommodate the view of the client, and this happens all the time, right? You might have an, you know, an Android client that wants only just certain data, 
and you don't want to call the whole service. Maybe you want to whittle down the uh, payload of the data. Maybe you want to like uh, just return some part of it. Maybe you want to get data from over here and over here and compose it into one thing. So reactive programming makes that kind of stuff very easy, but it's still code that you have to write. You know, it's still work. Um, and I'm all about not doing work. I mean, look at me. Do I? Do I look like, do I strike you as the kind of person that does work? No, I think not. Uh, instead, what I want is to have some way to have my cake and eat it too. Um, and this is, I think, the same bind in which Meta, nay, Facebook, uh, found themselves back in 2012. They had disparate services, but they wanted uh, those services to be uh, isolated. They wanted their encapsulation, but their clients wanted everything in one fell swoop, in one big gulp. Uh, and so they had to sort of walk, meet that, make that tension work. And they created something called GraphQL. Now, GraphQL, uh, is a really interesting technology. So source main resources, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna create a new folder called GraphQL, and in that I'll create a new file called, um, let's say, uh, uh, you know, crm.graphqls, okay? And in GraphQL, you create a root type called a query, that's the first type where all your client tools are going to look to inspect all the different endpoints that are available, and I'm gonna define a field called customer, right? Um, and uh, this in turn expects a type called customer. You can see that this is a, one to many value. I've got brackets. That means there's more than one value. It's not a scalar. It's, it's a, there's more than one value there. Uh, this in turn will have an ID and it'll have a name field. Voila. Uh, and so I can return that data. Now, of course, I could also uh, put other fields here that don't necessarily line up with the representation of the type in my Java code, right? So just because my Java type has ID and name, that doesn't mean that the GraphQL representation needs to. And indeed, I can have all sorts of other things. So let's go ahead and create a new controller here. CRM GraphQL controller. Uh, and this is going to also use my CRM client, CRM. Uh, and we're going to create a new endpoint here. And the endpoint is going to implement this query type. It's going to be a schema mapping for the type called query. Whoops, query. Uh, and the field name is called customers. Yeah. So I'm going to return a bunch of customers for that, uh, for that type. So when somebody tries to resolve that field for that type, we'll just call this method here, okay? Very good. Now, it turns out that this is a very common thing. Like I said, this is a well-known type query. You can have your own custom types, but all GraphQL projects will have a query type and possibly a mutation and possibly a subscription type. Um, and because it's such a common thing, we actually have a semantically more interesting uh, annotation called query mapping, which is a specialization of query mapping with the type name pre-filled out to query and the field derived from the name of the method. So this is semantically exactly the same as that. This is just a notational convenience for that. Let's go ahead and run this, but in order to, to kind of see what's happening, we need to enable a little graphical console, right? And this console allows us to query our GraphQL engine. Let's go ahead and restart, uh, port 9999, whoops, localhost 9999 forward slash graphical, get it, graphical. There we go. And now this is a little console you can use. You might've recognized it from other people that use, that use a GraphQL, so, uh, for, uh, GraphQL, I mean, so for example, API, uh, SpaceX is a spacefaring company that, I don't know, whatever, they do stuff. And uh, they have an API you can explore, for example, to see you know what's happening. And the nice thing about this is you can just ask questions and you only pay for what you use. So let's say I wanted uh, just this data, right? I don't want that. There you go. So I'm asking for just the last, just, just the mission name for the last 10 launches and I want the capsule information, no thanks. So I just want that, great, I only get that back. If behind the scenes there are other services that would have been involved in producing the response that has all this or whatever, you know, that's different. I don't have to pay for that network call, that service orchestration and composition call if I don't want it. I get back what I pay for, okay? Um, okay, so here's my API. Whoops, I actually did a screenshot. Do a query there, and you can see I get in introspection. I can just control space my way to production there, and I can make requests, and I get back what I'm expecting as GraphQL. So this makes it very easy to have a uniform uh, API, one big API that in turn federates all the other APIs and makes them available to the consumers that need them and in the shape that they want it to be. If you don't want the data, uh, if you don't want the name data, great, you don't pay for it. You just get that back. And this is very useful. This is kind of useful here, but it's very useful because you can have, let's say, um, let's say your customer has a type profile. Okay. So I've got now a, two, a, new, a new type for that called profile and it just has an ID. Uh, and that might recall, might be another microservice, right? So here I can say schema mapping type name equals customer, and I can build another type. And let's suppose I'm making another call to another microservice somewhere. Doesn't I'm not gonna actually do it, but you can imagine how that would work. Uh, I can now say profile, profile for the root type 
called customer, right? So I can say return new profile and the profile will be, you know, whatever, the same ID as the customer. So this could be a network call is my point. So this gets invoked, this method gets invoked to resolve that profile only if somebody asks for that profile. And this is one of the nice things about uh, GraphQL is you get your, you can have your cake and eat it too. So let's refresh this, paste. And now there's my um, uh, customers that I forget to add that. There's the type, oh, it's called type. I should have called it profile, but okay, type. So if I ask for the type, I get that back as well, right? Oh, there's nothing, uh, let's see. That's because I named the, the method wrong. I named it profile instead of uh, type, which is what it was originally. Just restart here quickly. Very good. We run. Uh, come on. Cust customers type. No, profile. Voila. Okay. There we go. There's my data. So there we go, my friends. There's an, uh, a number of different patterns that you can look at uh, to easily build services at scale. You can uh, use reactive programming to make your services more robust in the face of production outages and service topology changes to be more scalable, uh, you get to be more resilient. Uh, you can use things like uh, the GraalVM native image support in both Spring Boot 2.x and Spring uh, Boot 3.x coming up uh, to make your uh, to turn them into GraalVM images that perform in you know lightning fast, super super fast uh, speeds with very very small footprints. Uh, you can use build pack support to build Docker images that you can easily just take to production. You just say Maven Spring hyphen boot colon build hyphen image, uh, and of course you can build edge services using technologies like Spring Cloud Gateway, for which it turns out we wouldn't have had time anyway uh, using GraphQL and using Reactive APIs uh, to make our services more robust and more accessible to the consumers. And obviously all of this goes to production very quickly. You can use things like uh, JFrog for your artifact management, and you can use things like Azure Spring Cloud to take these these binaries and get them up and running in no time at all. I didn't even get a chance to show you things like centralized configuration using the Spring Cloud config server in Azure Spring Cloud, or service uh, service uh, location and discovery using uh, this the Spring Cloud Eureka support already pre-provisioned for you in Azure Spring Cloud. There's so many more things we could have talked about, but I'm afraid, my friends, we're just about out of time. Thank you for your time today. I hope you have a great day, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. All right. That was amazing, Josh. Thank you so much. That was like Thank you. That was was that a first like 25 minutes? Question no, but it's, it's definitely the first one today. Absolutely the first one today. I didn't <laughs> I haven't done any of them today. So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It was amazing. Fun. I, Thank I, you. I, I was watching the comments and people are in love with it.